Uh, well, thank you uh, very much, Freddie. Thank you for uh, uh, including me in this uh, uh, workshop. So my name is Daniel Weinstock. For people who don't uh, know me, it's a pleasure to be here. I, t I spent uh, 19 years, actually, in this department uh, and taught in this room uh, more times than I could probably count um, and was the founding director of what used to be the, the center formerly known as CREAM, uh, which is the uh, direct ancestor of the CREAM. Um, so it's a, it's a pleasure to be back, uh, at least for those two reasons, and to see uh, so many uh, friends around. I won't use all of my time uh, saying how happy I am uh, to be here, because the time <laughs> is, uh, is, is limited, although I could go on. Um, so I want to make, um, so my, my, my um, uh, uh, what I'm going to be uh, talking about is somewhat different, though related to what we just heard from uh, Joan. I'm now the director at McGill, so I moved to McGill six years ago, and I'm now a professor of the Faculty of Law, and I run uh, something called the Institute for Health and social policy, um, and uh, the, the the last word in that uh, in that name, the Institute for Health and Social Policy, uh, has become very important to me uh, because it seems to me that a lot of a lot of the way in which. Um, the various disciplines that are uh, important to the making of good public policy uh, tend to forget about the uh, importance of that that last word, policy. Uh, you know, so um, I work with a lot of people in empirical uh, social sciences now uh, and in. in epidemiology and uh, there's a tendency for, uh, for for them to say well you know we've done uh, some research here the results policymakers please you know uh, implement them uh, there's also a tendency for people who do normative work uh, to, to forget about the empirical dimensions of, uh, of public policy so I think it's important to bring them together uh, in ways that uh, do justice to the complexity of uh, public policy making and to its ethical nature uh, so uh, what is a public policy a public policy is the mobilization of all kinds of resources Resources, human, um, uh, obviously financial, but also time um, for the attainment of a public good. And so it's ethical in a number of ways, some of which you just read off the definition that I've just uh, offered, which is that uh, you're trying to do something for the public good. Um, but you're also trying to do it with, so that's the first important ethical dimension, but you're also doing it with public resources, resources that you have called through, say, taxation. Um, uh, so that, that's another dimension. You're also using the course of power of the state when you're uh, engaged in public policy policy as opposed to the kinds of policies that we enact in our institutions. So that heightens the ethical uh, demands. And there's also opportunity costs. Any policy is also something, any policy decision is also a decision as to what not to do. Uh, it therefore uh, excludes certain things that, on which we could have mobilized resources. Um, and it's also, um, it lays the groundwork for further policies. One of the things that we tend to forget in the ethics of uh, public policy making is what political scientists refer to as path dependency. The mistake you make today is not just a mistake today, it also makes a difference to what you can do later. You can't just erase bad policy uh, and pretend that it never happened. You, um, well, there's path dependency. So uh, th those are at least, I stopped counting, but at least five, maybe six ways in which uh, public policy decision making is really ethical and it's difficult because it's always decision making in conditions of, um, of uncertainty. Right? Uh, public policy makers have to do things that are terribly important for the reasons that I've pointed out, but they never really know how things are going to go. Right? Um, the best they can do is to try to adduce evidence, and that evidence is most often uh, probabilistic in nature. Uh, I, no, I, I made a mistake. It is always probabilistic in nature. Um, and um, you know, probabilities have this funny feature that things can go uh, either way. It's not logic. Right? It's not, uh, uh, there's, there's no necessity uh, attaching to uh, policy. So I think that it's a really, really tough and underexplored uh, area, the ethics of public policy decision making, uh, and it's something that I've uh, wanted to make some inroads in since I've been director of the Institute. So I want to make one very little point in this uh, presentation, which seems to me to be trivial, but probably you know, sometimes trivialities are good to, uh, to remind ourselves of. I've probably used up all my time, right? Uh, before no. even having, okay, I'm just joking. <laughs> uh, so, so, so the area that, the area that I'm particularly interested in as the, as the director of an institute for health and social policy is, as the name would indicate, uh, public policy in the area of health. Now, one of the most uh, interesting developments in health policy in the last 
30 years or so, and the, the name of the institute, which was a name that was given to it by its founder, Jody Heyman, who's now the director of the School of Public Health at uh, UCLA, um, it, it was very it was very carefully chosen. So it's not the Institute of Health Policy. It's the Institute of Health and Social Policy. And the premise upon which it is based, which is one that I think guides a lot of research and a lot of intervention in the area of healthcare today, is that what matters to health is not just healthcare, right? Um, health of individuals, health of populations, health differentials within a population are powerfully formed, are powerfully structured by all kinds of social determinants, and social determinants that are modifiable by policy, right? Uh, education matters to health, transport matters to health, um, uh, housing matters to health, income policy matters to health, and on and on and on. And what's more, they matter to health in a kind of a, uh, a more robust way. They attack, it seems, the upstream causes of people's health states, rather than, as in health care, just intervening at the sort of last point, giving you an aspirin for your headache, rather than trying to intervene at the level of what it is that is causing you to have headaches so often um, uh, in the first place. So um, there's a, there's there's a so the institute does uh, work on social determinants of health and looks at the ways in which social policies can be shaped so as to promote in a more durable, sustainable, because more upstream way, um, the uh, positive impacts on uh, people's on people's health. So there's a tendency amongst uh, people who work in the social determinants of health framework to think that in a way we've made a huge mistake in health policy over the course of the last 50 years. If you look at the Quebec budget, for example, a lot of talk recently about how much we pay our specialists, and you know we won't talk about that today because that would take us in a direction that could uh, occupy us for the whole time. If you look at the budget of Quebec, uh, the, the national budget in, say, the 70s, and you look at it today, you'll find a very interesting uh, thing in the comparison of education to health care. Right? They were about at the same proportion, uh, say back in the 70s. Um, as a proportion of the total budget, education has stagnated. It's roughly the same, of course the absolute amounts have increased, but uh, in terms of the proportion of our total budget, it's remained more or less where it was, something like 15% of the total budget, whereas healthcare has gone off uh, you know, uh, and skyrocketed, and depending on what you encompass within healthcare, arguably about half or even slightly more than half of our uh, complete budget. And so the social determinants of health um, sort of view would say, maybe that was a big mistake. Uh, maybe uh, we, rather than uh, spending a lot of money on health care, we should have been addressing things like education. Five minutes, that's terrible. Okay, um, <laughs> that, that, uh, that, uh, that occur more uh, upstream. So the little point that I want to make uh, is that um, we have to be careful about um, uh, the draw, drawing two hasty conclusions for the area of uh, public policy from all the things that I've said right now which strike me as completely true. Right, completely true. So very quickly, because I only have five minutes, the point that you know um, I, I want to make is um, there's a difference in the sort of causal uh, in the in the causal stories that you can tell in order to uh, sort of link um, a, a determinant of health with a health outcome. To put it very uh, briefly, the social determinants of health stories always tell uh, stories that are based on what we might refer to as long causal chains. What I mean here by long is that not that they're physically long, you can't measure them, but that there are a couple of things about them that um, have to be taken into account. One, um, there are a lot of intervening variables that can get in the way of a social determinant of health uh, giving rise to uh, a, a, a given health outcome. Something happened in Finland. Let's try it here. Oh, it didn't work here. Why? Well, because it turns out that there's this other thing that got in the way here, or an enabling factor in Finland that we hadn't fully accounted for. Now, epidemiologists spend their time trying to isolate those factors and account for them, but it's really, really difficult because, as it were, epidemiology is sort of like uh, you know what Hegel said about uh, the owl of Minerva, which is that you know you always realize after, oh God, I wish we'd seen that, and now we can start trying to factor it in. Um, there's also a, a very, it's, it, you know, it's one thing to understand that there's a causal relation somewhere. It's another thing to understand its precise mechanism. And one of the difficulties that we have in social determinants of health research is that we can sort of know that there's a causal relationship, um, but not understand the precise mechanism. And the precise mechanism is important to devising uh, interventions, policies that are going to achieve 
the right good. So in those two senses, uh, there is a complexity to um, the ways in which causal uh, mechanisms occur uh, in the area of social determinants of health that arguably isn't as present with respect to health care. Now I'm going to make two more points and then finish. I'll make them very, very quickly because I probably am one or two minutes from the end. So. But there's a point, there's a, there's a thing in Rawls' theory of justice. As someone who is sort of uh, you know schooled by Rawls, it's hard for me to give any presentation without talking about something in Rawls' theory of justice. But there's a point that Rawls makes uh, somewhere in uh, theory of justice that tends not to get uh, talked a lot about, which has to do with the um, structure of rationality and uh, the importance of risk aversion. Um, as a feature of rationality with respect to particularly important goods. Going for, swinging for the fences, to use a baseball analogy, which if you don't understand it, ask, ask the person next to you, is something that might make sense rationally with respect to certain kinds of goods that might be optional, not as important, but with respect to the goods that are foundational to our well-being, we are rational to adopt a policy uh, which Rawls famously uh, labeled or borrowed the term maximum. You know, let's assume that things will go wrong and try to maximize the minimum rather than swinging for the fen fences and going, say, for maxi max, right? Now, I think that the very, very sort of fraught probabilistic structure of social determinants of health reasoning makes it the case that if you apply that kind of reasoning to healthcare decision making, I'm making the assumption that healthcare finds itself within that basket of goods about which we should be prudent and therefore risk averse, right? Um, all of a sudden, it makes the choices between um, sort of healthcare based uh, policy decisions and social determinants of health based policy decisions surprisingly more difficult than we might have thought given the way that I've presented the social determinants of health thing at the beginning. It sounds like a no brainer. Of course you want to go for the, uh, for the uh, upstream determinant that's going to give rise to a more sustainable outcome. So all I've wanted to do really is to say it's a little bit more complicated of that than that because I think that policymakers in the area of health have an ethical duty to be prudent uh, risk averse when it comes to making choices um, and in ways that might incline us to not being quite as aghast when we look at those curves. If I had a, I would have showed the curves of how budget, uh, budgetary allotment in Quebec has gone. It might not be as, you know, um, uh, unethical a development as that. Now, three caveats really quickly if I have time. Um, this is on the assumption, um, oh, I probably should stop, right? Take the minute. Okay, so basically the point I'm trying to make is that we, if we integrate the probabilistic uh, structure of uh, reasoning in fully to decision making in health, and if we uh, take on the ethical requirement of being prudent, we might end up, when choices need to be made, finding ourselves more inclined than we might have thought to uh, the, uh, at the outset to sort of healthcare as opposed to health. Three assumptions that I'm making here, or three caveats that I should make about this conclusion. First of all, this is on the assumption that there are choices to be made, right? It, this is on the assumption that we actually find ourselves in a dilemmatic policy choice space where it's either A or B. That's not always the case. Second of all, and this is something about which I've written at length in other uh, papers, um, the goods, education, uh, uh, housing, transportation, etc., which are seen by social determinants of health theorists as important for health, have separate rationales unrelated to health, which, inc which should incline us towards making social investments in them. And indeed, one of the things that I've sort of done in other writing of mine is let's not hitch the wagons of these other goods. Let's not hitch them to the sole good of health. Let's not healthify all goods. There are other rationales in public policy uh, decision making for having good public housing, good transportation, et cetera, available uh, to all people. And the third assumption that I'm making, and this is an assumption which I recognize may be truer in certain areas of health care than in others, is that we understand the causal pathways between health care interventions and health outcomes better than we do those of social determinants of health. And I think that that varies a great deal across areas of health. And cer in certain areas of health, I think uh, that assumption, indeed, is probably defeated. And I'm thinking in particular of the area of mental health, where we still seem to me to be um, sort of um, tr in a very much trial and error kind of phase in the same way as we are with respect to social determinants of health. So I'm not sure what this changes about your argument, but I just want to throw it out there and see what you say. So when looking at the two different curves in terms of expenditure, education and health, 
Some people's reaction is, is the following. They say, for instance, Eric Shekhard, I think he's in Belgium, uh, says this. He says, you know, an aging population with yeah. more and more resources, it's completely normal yeah. that the health budget goes up. Yeah. Right? Um, so just looking at the two curves on its own yeah. is not a, you know, yeah. not a sufficient or a reliable indicator that we, that we haven't done enough upstream investment in health and not enough downstream. Yeah. Right? yeah. So, um, do we have any studies that, that try to control that aspect? Um, if not, you know, probably should. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, that's a very good point. Uh, and um, uh, the answer is there probably are. There are studies about everything, right? Uh, but I don't, I don't know what they are. So the assumption underlying my paper is that even if we control for it, there might still be, you know, um, the, the curve might be a little bit flatter relative to the other one, but it would still be, uh, you know, there'd still be, and I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that that would be the, the case. If we control for things like the egregious overpayment of health professionals and the fact that there's a natural slide towards healthcare as the population gets older, um, and, and for two reasons. One is that an older population has more healthcare needs, and the other thing is an older population, when it votes for, par for political parties, will tend to look favorably upon platforms that uh, cater to its needs rather than the needs of uh, people, people yet further down the uh, the age tree, but so the assumption is that even if we were to control for those things, we still have a kind of a you know healthcare sort of sh taking off a, a, a little bit more relative to. Uh, but that's definitely something that we should uh, that I that I need to to factor in uh, absolutely. Um, we've lost about it. I'm going to take. No, it. no, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking Sorry. for a chair for Greg. Chairs in the next hallway. Just on you. I can do that. Why the chair? Uh, other questions? Well, then I have one. Okay. Danya. Sure. It sounded like uh, the theoretical framework for going upstream, social determinants, preventive, is consequentialist, but also your risk aversion is consequentialist. Is this a correct understanding? Are you still with, on the same theoretical ground, or is there a tension there as well? Oh, gosh. Um, you may have to flesh the question out a little bit more because uh, I'm not sure that I... Uh, so in a way, they're both about maximizing the public good, but these are two conflicting visions of yeah, how to do that. Yeah. Not necessarily, because you know I'm leaving it open. What the uh, it could be that the good that we're seeking to achieve is, for example, um, uh, um, reducing inequalities, right? Where reducing inequalities may actually, according to certain scenarios, have costs relative to aggregate. Uh, utility. So I'm not assuming sort of a flat uh, consequential, consequentialism. Um, you know, risk, risk aversion is, uh, I mean, I guess at a certain point, you know, Philip Pettit has taught us that you can consequentialize everything, right? Uh, and I guess you can also consequentialize the argument for, uh, for risk aversion. And the, the argument would be, it is rational to give a lot of weight, right, to certain kinds of risk. Weights that might be that might look disproportionate in other uh, in other contexts. Now that is you know th there's a way of telling that story which I think is more complicated than a flat consequentialism. But there's also a way of telling that story which says that the reason why what I've said is the case is because the good with respect to which we are uh, aiming um, sort of uh, greater risk aversion in certain areas uh, is perhaps less risk aversion in other areas of practical reasoning, right? That good, whatever it is, you know, call it well-being or something. Um, in a way, I'm not that, uh, I'm not, so, so I think you can consequentialize everything. There's a sort of flat-footed consequentialism, which I think is assumed by neither of the, um, the, um, the risk of yeah, or, yeah. Uh, and to the extent that you can petitify, uh, you know, um, both strands of the argument, to some degree, you know, consequentialism achieves pyrrhic victories when it has to uh, revert to uh, values at such a level of abstraction that it can say, you know, what looks like, you know, value pluralism <coughs> to you, I can turn into a one-value consequentialism by going sufficiently abstract. I, I, at a certain point, I start losing, stop losing, I start losing, you know, a uh, handle on what the theoretical stakes are. Now, uh, you, 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 you're the boss, so... Caroline. Caroline. Okay. Je parle en français. Bien sûr, oui, oui, il n'y a pas de problème. 
Euh, Caroline, quel exemple j'ai fait une maîtrise en biotique, je terminais l'année passée, euh, et puis euh, je suis présidente de l'Ordre des médecins vétérinaires maintenant. Euh, moi, je, je, je me nourris beaucoup là, de ce qui se passe euh, du côté des humains aussi. Puis je, dans, dans votre réflexion, ce que vous disiez, je, ça me fait penser que euh, dans, quand on, on pense de façon conséquentialiste, euh, et euh, puis vous parlez, vous parlez d'agir sur les déterminants de la santé versus agir sur les soins de la santé directement. Mais c'est tellement euh, plus concret et plus simple et ça donne tellement euh, l'impression d'agir plus quand les gens agissent sur les soins de santé. Parce que c'est plus, euh, comme, un peu comme vous disiez, c'est plus euh, mesurable, c'est plus, euh, plus visible. Alors que des actions euh, plus euh, en amont euh, sont moins... Euh, c'est moins clair. On a des preuves moins... Euh, Évidentes. Oui. C'est ça. Oui. C'est ça, ça, ça rend la, la difficulté. Oui. Là, j'ai perdu mon... Le fil. Ah bon, oh oui, c'est ça. Puis notre, nos leviers d'action sont moindres aussi. C'est beaucoup plus, euh, beaucoup plus euh, complexe d'avoir un levier d'action sur euh, les, les déterminants de la santé. Puis là, ça s'applique à la population animale aussi, ce que je dis là. Euh, les leviers d'action sont beaucoup plus complexes à élaborer oui. que de, de oui. juste sur les soins. Oui. Ben, alors, une des choses que, que je présuppose, et je pense que c'était implicite dans dans l'introduction, c'est que euh, la prise de décision responsable dans le domaine de la politique publique euh, doit se doter quand même d'outils de mesure. Euh, le, 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 le défi, c'est de ne pas se donner des outils de mesure qui sont réducteurs, qui ne, sont, qui ne reflètent pas la réalité euh, complexe de ce qu'on essaye d'atteindre. Et jusqu'à un certain point, je pense que votre, euh, votre remarque, je peux en faire euh, euh, de l'eau, je peux la laisser de l'eau pour à mon moulin, euh, parce que euh, jusqu'à un certain point, pour moi, le fait que euh, on éduque mieux une population, par exemple, et que euh, les indicateurs, euh, disons, proprement éducatifs, soient utilisés pour, euh, euh, pour, pour mesurer ce succès, bon, c'est déjà un peu compliqué de mesurer quel, quels indicateurs on veut. Pour moi, c'est suffi suffisant pour justifier, du moins à première vue, des mesures dans le domaine de l'éducation. Il y a un réflexe que, euh, disons, la théorie des, des déterminants sociaux de la santé a engendré, qui, je trouve, est un réflexe de trop, qui consiste à dire « et en plus, ça a un impact sur la santé euh, ». Et là, on se met sur la défensive, parce que là, ça devient plus difficile de, de faire, de, de montrer quels sont les liens de causalité précis, euh, de mesurer de manière précise, ça, ça, ça s'étend dans le temps. Hein, euh, je suis dans un projet actuellement dirigé euh, euh, de, de, où on regarde un peu l'impact euh, sur les enfants et sur les mères euh, des dix années au Québec où nous avons eu euh, un système de garderie euh, universel avec euh, sans, euh, sans différence dans les, euh, dans les soins d'accès. Ben, les les, les impacts réels se mesurent sur des années et des années, là, les, les, et, et dans, dans, sur des années et des années, et plein d'autres facteurs, euh, plein d'autres facteurs causaux qui vont, se, qui vont intervenir, de sorte qu'il sera difficile de dire « Ah, c'est à cause du système de garderie qu'on a eu des bons ou des mauvais résultats ». Et donc, on se met un peu sur la défensive en essayant de démontrer que euh, ces mesures-là ont un impact sur la santé, alors qu'on peut être sur un coup de pied beaucoup plus positif en disant « Écoutez, il euh, y a des valeurs autres que celles liées à la santé qu'on dessert et qu'on peut mesurer de manière plus « real time ». Euh, bon, c'est ça. Donc, euh, je pense que on est, on, on s'en oh, ouais, un peu dans le même je, sens. Je vous comprends très bien, c'est ça. Puis, des fois, euh, euh, il faut faire attention quand on évoque, quand on évoque euh, des, des justifications euh, de données probantes, s'ils sont pas tout à fait concluantes, ça peut nous. Euh, ah oui, oui, oui. On, euh, se met, on se met sur le. Euh, ben oui, 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 tout à fait, tout à fait, tout à fait. Alors Absolument. que la, ça peut être motivé par bien d'autres. Oui. Moi, je vous suis. Merci. Uh, thank you, Ben. Thank you.